evening, Cherries fans, and welcome to the second part of our interview with Trevor Watkins. Now, before we welcome Trevor back on, here's a little bit about our sponsors, Dental on the Banks. To find out about what they can do for you, visit dentalonthebanks.co.uk. So we've covered off quite a bit already with Trevor about winter gardens and, of course, becoming chairman. So in this interview, we are going to discuss what happened and how his time at AFC Bournemouth ended, but also the future for the club and also the 2008 Great Escape, where Jeff Mostyn helped save the club a second time. So it is a pleasure to welcome back onto the show, Trevor Watkins. Welcome back, Trevor. Good to have you back with us. Great. and Lovely to see you again. Looking forward to this part. There's lots to talk about. Yeah, most definitely. So let's pick up from where we left off. Um, Mm -hmm. And of course, you released a book called Cherries in the Red. Um, Back in 1999, it was shortly Mm -hmm. after you took control of the club. What was the general reception of the book? Well, the point behind the book was that most people never get their story told. Uh, some of the people we've discussed before, you know, the, the Ken Dandos, the Andy Noonans, um, Terry Lovell, whoever it might be, there were hundreds, if not, well, there were thousands of people who had played a part in saving the club. Mm-hmm. And from my perspective, I went into WH Smith's one lunchtime and thought, wouldn't it be great if we actually could write a book? Well, who's going to write? Well, I'll write it. Why don't I write it? And I sent a letter to about six publishers saying, look, a town has got together and has saved its football club. Yeah. I think it's a great story. And I had, of the six publishers, two wrote back and said, look, actually, this is a really good story. This this is, this is really what movies are made about and really is human interest but we'd like a ghostwriter to do it. When I got a ghostwriter to, to help start writing it, mm-hmm. and it was very dry. It was all fairly, you know, theory and looking into business of football. I said, it's not what this is about. Anyway, so that we ch- I changed it. I wanted it to be about all the people, all the humans that have participated and the bits, that, whether it's Buster Merrifield with the film we made, but saving the yes. cherries, keeping the dream alive, or whether it was you're down to... to um, Steve Fletcher or Mel Machin, all the way through to, to, to everybody, Ron Hands in the Supporters Club, you know, everybody, colourful or otherwise, that, that, that played their part. And the, the only thing I fell out with them about was they had full editorial control. And when they sent me the dust cover, it said, you know, how one fan saved his club and became chairman. I said, no, 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 that's not what it's about. And they, they insisted. I said, this is this is not the way it is. This is not what's happened. It is a town. I might have been the figurehead, mm-hmm. and that's fine. But I'm writing this to speak on behalf of everybody, whether it was the person I was dating at the time, whether it was my friends who didn't see me for two, three years, whether it's the, the, the impact on all the other committee members and so on and so forth. So when the book came out, on a sort of global basis, it got great reception. Really, really pleased with it. I think locally, some people were irked with that that subtitle. And that annoyed me in the sense that I didn't want it to be that. 
so that was the one thing I, I didn't like about the book coming out. But generally speaking, I, got, I mean, I got some tremendous reviews. I ended up on television in Australia, um, sitting behind a desk in a pair of shorts because you couldn't see that, doing an interview about the book in uh, Jacket and Tie. And the one thing I was really pleased about was that it did get the story out there globally. It did tell everybody that this was a town that cared, that this was a group of people across a community that show what the power of people getting together is. Of course, you mentioned there Buster Merrifield as well, um, mm. a big star in Only Fools and Horses. What was it like to get him on board and get people in the local community who were big names? Well, I think that the amazing thing was, I remember a, a big PR firm that's still around now, probably remain nameless, contacting us a few weeks in and saying, we'd love to be your PR agency. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, I said. Um, we'll get your story out there, but we want £25,000 a month. Which <laughs> I said, we can do that. We can do that. And because of my background in having worked with the BBC, I was relatively confident in doing media. And that's the thing about a team. You know, you need you need a goalkeeper, you need defenders, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what we had. We had retail experts, Andrew Kay, John Hiscox, Peter Aldersley had run businesses. We had a Ken Dando, absolutely passionate, and all the supporters knew Ken. They didn't know me, but they knew Ken, and they could trust him, and that's important. So together we made a great team. So my role was to, to speak to the media a lot. And so getting the message out there and getting it out and continuing it was really important to us. And that's what we did. And we came up with loads of wacky ways. We talked about Southampton playing at Bournemouth. Um, <laughs> we had food fairs. You know, We had bucket collections. We had sponsored walks. We had pop concerts. We had, you name it, we tried it. And we consistently and continually evolved that story, that narrative, to keep it alive, to keep the dream alive. Because if we didn't, that would be the end. I remember the BBC and The Echo were quite supportive at the time. Did you find that? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think the role of the media is to be quizzical and is to be questioning, and it should do that. And it should do that fairly and look to call people to account mm -hmm. and that is really really fundamental but equally the the guys who worked and the girls who worked on Solent who worked on uh, the Daily Echo were absolutely 2CR as it was at the time mm -hmm. were absolutely incredible in the way they supported the club and publicized it and didn't ask for anything back it was good for them yeah good coverage I mean this is a great story this is a town fighting. Remember, we, we took a, a long time to get to the point where we could actually try and buy the club. And that wasn't on the cards to begin with. And so those media outlets that supported, they were brilliant. And they're still brilliant today. You know, I, I very much enjoy, as people know, working with the media, talking, coming up with ideas, talking about opinions, looking at what, and that's where I've ended up in my career. So to that end, it's fantastic to have had that opportunity and when you question, why did everybody do it? We absolutely did it because we believe in the club and we care passionately about it. You know, there's not necessarily many people that would enjoy the idea of landing at, wherever it was, Heathrow Airport, up at 10 in the morning and driving straight to Chesterfield to see a League One game where we get absolutely tonked. Mm -hmm. And then you wonder the way back why you did it. You did it because you care, because you were part of it. And that, that's what everybody did all the way through this journey and still do today. Going back onto the pitch, um, mm. of course, in 2000, and it was just after the Bristol City game, um, you moved Mel Machin upstairs and placed Sean O'Driscoll in charge. What was the reason behind that? That was, I mean, even now, I mean, those board discussions should probably remain confidential. Mm. But the board would always, at every board meeting, consistently evaluate and look at the progress of the team on the pitch, how things were going. Um, sometimes you do need to shake things up to get new ideas flowing through to make sure things are working. I think that, you know, and football has changed dramatically since that time in the, the way in which it's structured. 
you still see it to an extent where you get a manager comes in, he brings five coaches and that's it. Mm-hmm. You know, in any other business that you or I might work in, if you lose yeah. your job, you, not just like another 10 of you lose your job too and you go because you all work together. The football's moved and sport has moved more towards a, a corporate type structure where if one person goes, the rest stay if they're good enough. And I think with, with, with Mel and with Sean, Sean is a very, very good coach. Um, Mel, it was, the, I think the board would have, I have to go back to our board minutes, but felt at that time it was the right moment to move things around, to give Sean his due, give him the, the authority, the power to move forward. And that Mel had a vast amount of experience. But, you know, Mel, if you think about it, Mel had lived through some very stressful times and had performed with dignity, aplomb. Um, look, if, if we lost a game, I would know that I was probably not getting out of Dean Court till at least eight, nine o'clock that night. Because it would take quite some time for Mel to get to the point where he was and he always did, comfortable to come up to the boardroom and chat about what had gone before. Um, sometimes he'd be livid. Sometimes he'd be absolutely delighted with the way the afternoon had gone. But come what may, he would always be there. And I think that, that that's the sign of a, a great character. You don't run and hide when things get difficult. Um, I like a phrase I read recently. The good thing about storms is they'll always come to pass and go. Yeah. And that's what I like in football. You know, we <laughs> you should try being on a coach when we, we, we've lost 3-1 at Colchester United and um, Smith has been on the pitch for about 90 seconds and has got sent off. Yeah, these things happen. Yeah. Um, so that was the right time. It was the right time to just move things around and give the team the ability to move forward. Do you feel as well that um, Mel did help Sean um, in the early days uh, when Sean took over at Dean Court? There's always a really interesting dynamic between manager and assistant manager. (laughs) The thing about, they were different characters, quite quiet in their own way. Um, and you may remember that we brought Peter Grant in. Yeah. Why do we bring Peter in? Far from quiet. Mm-hmm. He called himself Peter the Pointer because he's always <laughs> yeah <laughs> telling everybody where to go. Um, but Peter brought an energy and a character. You know, we, I don't know Laurel and Hardy, Anton Deck, Morgan and Wise. You name these uh, yeah. double acts. You often find that personalities even in you know, relationships, go well together if they're different, if there's a different dynamic. And it's rare in life you get those perfect combinations. And I was saying, not saying that Mel and Sean were perfect, but they had a good understanding and a healthy respect for each other. There's some managers, assistant managers have seen where the assistant manager is literally there to pick up the cones and put them out. Mm-hmm. And, and literally is a yes person. And I, I don't think that's good for any organisation. I think it's good to have people who question in a in a fair way, not just because they they question every single thing. That um, it's like having a great meal in a restaurant and then complaining about it because you always complain. Mm-hmm. Pick your times. And the funniest thing is that Mel and Sean did get on. Maybe didn't see eye to eye all the time. Sean and Peter and Sean was heavily involved in recruitment of Peter recognize that he was a different type of character. I certainly, I I found I got a lot closer to Sean over the years than I did when he was manager at the club. Um, And, you know, I've I've put him forward for a number of roles subsequently, some of which he's got. And I've then always enjoyed being able to sit down and listen, which is, is an art really. I think, you know, it's like, like someone who works for Samaritans, being able to listen to somebody is, in a proper way is, is really quite impressive. And Sean's got a lot to say, he might be quiet. And so it was, it was a good dynamic and a successful one, you know, for a ragtag bunch of supporters and other fans who together got their club to the auto windscreens final and top seven finish 
holding their own in League One. It's not not bad doing. I mean, obviously, in the end, we went down and then came back up through the Lincoln playoff. And look where we are now. Was you disappointed when your time as chairman come to an end? And you did touch on it a little bit yesterday, but um, or do you feel it was time um, for you to hand over the reins? Yeah, I think leadership, of which I know a lot more now, mm-hmm. there are leaders for war and there are leaders for peace. I was, I think I was an excellent leader in war. I, I, I strategized, I worked out the campaign to how we were going to save the club and I delivered it. Yeah. And I persuaded enough people to trust and to, to work behind to make that happen. I couldn't have done it on my own. And I was the figurehead. I think that it's a big ask if you're going to do the job properly to be an unpaid chairman of a football club. Now, things have moved on and um, chairmen are paid these days and paid reasonably well for doing so across clubs. And in, in many ways, that's right. They should be. But at that time, we we weren't. None of the directors were. I mean, I used to go to Tesco and buy wine for the boardroom so we had something to give people to drink. Um, and we never claimed that back in expenses. That was just the way we rolled with it. So for me, there was going to come a natural point where it would be my time to step down. It was too costly to me Mm -hmm. in in personal terms. I went from, and this is not from a sympathy perspective, because life has worked out incredibly well. And I, there are many things that are happening in my life now that wouldn't have happened but for what happened at the rescue of the club. But I got to a point where, it was the right time, even if I hadn't admitted that to myself, to step down. Because four years as chairman, another year as director, you know, ultimately, um, we we did our job. We all did our job. And, you know, you can tell when you're getting tired in a role. It was very intense, very pressurised. You, you're never going to please everybody. You know, the Jamie Vincent, Vincent sale we talked about in our previous uh, discussion. Yeah. I remember a guy, cloth cap, getting up and pointing his finger, saying, you ruined our club. I thought, we've made the best decision we could. That's what I was talking about. Other chairmen and other like Abdul and so on, people who've come in and done a great job, they've made their decisions based on what they have in front of them at that moment. And if they've made it honestly by assessing everything, some people go, oh, you're stupid. You shouldn't have done this or whatever. I'm not in that camp. You know, you, you make your decisions. So I I got really got to the end of the road. I mean, I'd probably be a far better chairman now than I was then. I know an awful lot more. I went on the board of the Football League. I've worked in sport for 20 years now. I work globally. I've made some great friends across the industry. I could probably, in, in many ways, I could probably do far more for Bournemouth now than I did 20 years ago plus, but I'm never going to have the same effect as I did then. And I I don't know, you know, I was adopted the son of a 17 year old mum who um, already had a one and a half year old son. A couple of hundred miles away from where she lived, I I was born. I know that, you know, my birth mum never ever spoke about me to anybody after that. And yet, a family with hardly any money took me into their house when I was a few months old and then moved to Bournemouth when I was three or four. And that gave me this life that I have now. So I can't complain. I'm very, very lucky with what's happened to me in my life and the way that has developed. And I, every day I I do get, I know it might sound like it'd be emotional, but do give thanks for the way life has turned out. And I've got, some amazing people in my life, some amazing friends, people I'm extremely close to, people who are incredibly special to me. And that that's come out of all the experiences. I'm not, I wouldn't be the person today that if it hadn't been for what happened then. So that's a long winded answer. In a way, I'm disappointed with the way it came to an end to have someone effectively, uh, who's one of your best friends, almost be put up to coming to see you and saying, oh, they, so-and-so thinks you should step down as chairman now. That That's not the way that should have been dealt with. 
but ultimately people make decisions and it was the right thing to do because I didn't have the money to put in. I've never had the money, well, never had the big money to put in to keep the club alive. I, I had time. So, you know, I think that there's a few of us ex-chairmen still knocking around the club. Um, and, you know, I I think I've got a pretty good relationship with Jeff Mostyn. We've, we've had some quite funny adventures together. Um, I suggested we go for a walk in New York one day, which he agreed to, and then complained bitterly in the nicest way when about three and a half year hours later we were still walking. <laughs> <laughs> we, did that, we did go and watch a game of basketball that night. But, you know, you... Yeah, Bournemouth. Bournemouth is a lovely club where protest used to be when our OAPs would throw their cushions on the pitch. Um, you know, we we have lots of nice people there. Mm-hmm. And we're now a club that's steely as well. So yeah, I, I was disappointed with the way it ended, but I have just consistently followed the club and supported the club and learned that you do what you believe in and you do things for the right reasons. And some, sometimes you have to make very, very tough decisions whether that's work, whether it's business, whether it's your personal life, whatever. Um, that's why I shared something about my my origins a few minutes ago, because people made some tough decisions that ultimately gave me the life that I've had. Uh, and so four years as chairman and a year extra as director were really the foundation of where I am now. If it wasn't, and I'd gone and been an English teacher as I'd always intended, mm-hmm even after being chairman, I'd still be incredibly grateful for, for the time that I had then. Of course, there was a second brush uh, for the club, and that was in 2007, 2008. Um, did you feel that that situation was avoidable? And did you think at that time that the club would be saved again? I thought it would be a lot harder incredibly hard uh, you know some of the personalities involved had come to my office in London and talked about their aspirations I think in reality we needed a Max Demin or a Bill Foley then mm-hmm. but we never found them we you know we were forever half in and half out of existence and that is a hard place to be. Uh, we never had, and you know, as I've shared with you, we, and we've always been very open, we never had the money that was going to buy us the long-term survival. But there again, neither had the previous owners. So we gave it a go as, as we coined it, Europe's first community club. It was a, a way of keeping the story in the press. And we pulled together and the supporters did that. And they did that with the stadium appeal that we spoke about. But ultimately, uh, you know, I remember the club organized a pop concert with a number of different artists on the stage at Dean Court. Now that was a, that was a decision uh, at the new stadium. That was a decision framed in a desire to try and create new revenue streams, but it went wrong. And I remember being rung that day say, uh, on the day of the event, saying it was a three day event, actually, the first day. Have you got any money you could give us like five thousand pounds, ten thousand pounds? Because we need to pay the artists. If we can't pay the artists. Everybody's going to lose loads of money. And I, I wasn't in a position to do that at that point. But other people were and they did. So this kind of hand to mouth existence trying to survive. We we didn't have anything that allowed us to be a to, catalyst to huge growth going forward. So, no, I wasn't surprised when we got to 2007, 2008, and these, these, these situations arose again. But that time, we did have someone who came forward. Yeah. Jeff, he didn't have to, but he did. And he did step forward. And he could easily have not written a check. In the same way as I could easily have said, you know what, that night before we had to make a decision, do we sign the legal documents or not? I could have said, you know what, I don't think we can do that to people, even though they told us that we could. So these are pivotal moments in life where you go one way or the other. 
And I would hope, luckily for Bournemouth, we went that way when I was doing the takeover and rescue and leading it in that sense. We went that way when Jeff decided whether to write a check or not. And in the end, that worked out because Jeff's actions led to the great escape eventually, mm -hmm. led to Eddie Mitchell, which led to Max Demin. Max Demin led to Premier League, led to Eddie Howe having his career formed in many ways. So all these things are knock-ons. Um, and here we are now with Bill Foley coming in. Another step, another evolution. One man you mentioned there, of course, in quite some detail, Jeff Mostyn. And yeah. there's a very, very famous clip where Gerald Krasner says, if you give me the nod, you know, you're signing the cheque. If you shake your head, I'm winding the club up today. If Jeff Mostyn wasn't able to sign that cheque, was there an alternative to save the club? No. There are so many times when we've been at five to midnight, three minutes to midnight, one minute to midnight, that there is always hope that some way will be found. But eventually things come to an end. And I think at some point it would have come to an end. You know, I remember working with Salisbury City in a similar situation and they ended up going down a couple of leagues. And that is probably what would have happened to Bournemouth. Um, but there again, and I'm ever the optimist, uh, ever believe in faith, hope, love, etc. You know, here, people's faith, their hope, their love for the club, something would have given and something would have been achieved. Now, as it is, touch wood, luckily we haven't had to worry about that for a few years now. And yeah. we've had a fairly stable, very close-knit, very tight-knit management taking the club forward. Um, an owner that, most unlike myself, didn't like doing media interviews. Chief executive who doesn't really do interviews. Chairman who doesn't do interviews really much anymore. But are all genuine, nice people who really do care about what's going on and want to see the club succeed. And, you know, I've had the and genuine, genuine pleasure of knowing not just Jeff, but Neil Blake. I mean, Richard Hughes was a player I signed. By the way, if anybody ever wants to go to a great Italian restaurant in London, his family have got a, a, a lovely place in, near Piccadilly. And you know, he's at the club. And I was talking to the director of football, a major European football club, and he, he said something along the lines out, the problem about Bournemouth is they just recruit people who are known to them or people who are not uh, perhaps exciting or... Now, you can view that a number of ways. And it's true to an extent. You know, you've, got a, you've got a number of people who have had links to the club who've been there, and that's an advantage. But equally, you can see other people come in, and every club has its own identity, You know, has its own type of players that it wants to recruit, its position it wants to be in. You know, what's Dagenham, what's Dagenham and Redbridge's aspiration? Where do Leighton Orion want to be? Where does Bournemouth want to be? I mean, Bournemouth's in the Premier League. Now, that was just a dream only a few years ago. So I think you, you, you find that all the different owners inherit, and this is where you talk about custodianship, guardianship of a club, they inherit the DNA of a club. Yeah. And I think for Bournemouth, that's, that's um, something that might be about to change, um, but in a good way. One thing that I do see a lot of, and a lot of it, is spoken about on social media mm. is criticism of Jeff Mostyn, Neil Blake, Richard Hughes. Personally, I think they've done a fantastic job keeping this club on a good financial footing and actually getting us to where we are today. What would you say to those fans that do criticise them? Well, it's all a question of perspective, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Let's talk generally. You have players that might earn 50,000, 100,000, yeah. 200,000 pounds a week. Why can they justify and how can they justify that money? And if you're the CEO 
of what is actually a relatively small business because the only size the only money that really makes a difference here is the premier league tv rights so in a way hospitality ticketing security it's not that complicated but whether you're a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or whatever your pay is reflected according to what is the business what is the level of income so it doesn't really matter where it comes from yeah so people turn around and say oh we don't like where it is neil blake's bugatti car or we don't like the fact that he's got an attractive wife or you know those sort of things those very flippant criticisms that you hear about and see repeated. It's like, so what? He, he has a life that is his life. Mm -hmm. Like all of us, you you get on and enjoy your life. You know, Je Jeff, he might be, who knows, paid, not paid. Let's say he is paid a lot of money. Mm -hmm. He's the one that turns up in the boardrooms. He's the one that is the ambassador for the club. He's the one that fulfills that role of chairman. And yeah, at some point, just by the fact we, we all life comes to an end for all of us. Hopefully that doesn't, no, I'm not wishing Jeff, Jeff any ill will, but people move on. They like, I, I moved on. You come to a point where you change. It, football is like a goldfish bowl. It's very, in, very introspective. These guys, they just turn up and do their job and they work incredibly hard. Yeah. At the end of the day, if they were, if someone was stealing money, defrauding the club, arms smuggling, drug dealing, that's that. Yeah, that's where you can point the finger and say that's what they're, that's criminal. That shouldn't be happening. The mere fact of the color or type of car someone's got, who they're married to, who they're dating, the way they they run their life, ultimately, is it for us to have an opinion on that? No. Look at what they do for the club. This is a club that's been promoted to the Premier League twice in the last five, seven years. This is a club where the owner has trusted these people mm -hmm. to perform those roles. We're all, we, we all have our own, we all have our own insecurities. We all have our own different ways of doing things, our, our own dress sense, where we cut our hair. You know, ultimately, we're all individuals. And Neil, Jeff, uh, Richard, They wouldn't have been, actually, they probably wouldn't have been in their positions for the, as long as they are if they had been doing something bad. So if they haven't done that, just look at what they do. And I think it goes back to, I, I'm not saying, I don't, I don't agree with every decision that's been made, the ones I know about. I don't agree with necessarily every, every decision that will be made ultimately, but that's not my job. Because ultimately, I go to support the club, I go to support the team on the pitch, and I trust, unless there's something there to the contrary, I trust that the people that are entrusted in running the club day to day are doing their level best. And I say, I have had the privilege of getting to know Jeff. I know Neil fairly well. And, you know, they care. And I, I work with somewhere between 50 and 100 clubs across Europe. Our largest clients, Liverpool, Everton, Manchester City. Our, our smallest clients in the league are the likes of Swindon Town um, and Sutton United, probably the smallest in, in the football league. And every club I go to, people care and are passionate about how they run it. And similarly, when I talk to people externally, everybody has a good word to say about Jeff. You know, Paul Mitchell, who's uh, another director of football I know, at AS Monaco, has got a lot of time for Richard Hughes. Michael Edwards, who was the director of football at Liverpool, who's a good friend, he also would go out of his way to help Richard. That says a lot to me that two of the people that I most respect in the European game, who are right at the top of their game, think that Richard Hughes is a decent guy with a decent history and a decent ability to spot players. Neil's much quieter. He's much more private. Um and so he's maybe not so well known as Jeff and Richard. But I'm sure that people look at Bournemouth, they say this is a club that they they respect, they like. Yeah. We need a new permanent end. We need better hospitality. We need infrastructure that reflects a Premier League club. 
what that means, I did an interview recently, what that means and what shape or form it takes, it's very much down to what makes sense. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, Gary O'Neill was appointed manager mm. recently and there was criticism about that and promoting from within. But we've done that before. And we've done that with Eddie Howe. And, of course, look at what a success he was. Did you see from when Eddie Howe took that manager's job or did you see when you was in contact with him all those years ago that he was going to be able to do that? Look at the people who turned up the day the trust fund took control of the club, bought the club. Mm -hmm. There was Andrew Kay and myself and Ken Dando. Mm -hmm. But it was Steve Fletcher and Eddie Howe and John Bailey who were there. I mean, characters through and through, mm -hmm. people who in their DNA had something that made them all leaders and that morally and from a, a passion, a driven perspective, had something that made them stand out. And Eddie wasn't lucky with his playing career. It came to an end quite abruptly. But I haven't seen Eddie for some time um, since he went to Newcastle. But again, I felt um, tremendously privileged that we would get together from time to time and share ideas and talk about how Burnley had gone, the effect of what had happened with his mum, family, and so on. And you can see that. And you know, it goes back to... He is an extremely good manager, but part of life, you continue to evolve and develop. And you can see that's what he's doing. You know, the, the experience of Bournemouth has led to him now managing a much bigger wage bill, much, much more ability to bring in top players and a, a much broader expectation that this should be a top six club. It's not all about having the money, not all about having the money. And so, <clears throat> yeah, there's, there's things there. And, you know, I think we've, we've always been blessed with the type of character and the players we've had and the way in which they have wanted to associate themselves with the club on and off the field. Of course, um, Bill Foley has just recently taken over from Maxim Denham. Let's just park Bill Foley for a moment in that takeover and just discuss the great job that Maxim Denham has done. He has been a chairman that hasn't really been in the media spotlight, but he has always come good when the club have needed it most. Um, what do you think, you know, and what do you make of his time at AFC Bournemouth? And do you think that that is probably the biggest transition that's ever happened in football, where we've gone from being on minus 17 all the mm. way to the Premier League and... A lot of it is thanks to Maxim, but of course, Eddie Mitchell, Jeff Mostyn, Neil Blake and Richard Hughes and those people around him. Well, I mean, first and foremost, it's down to Eddie Mitchell. Yeah. And I know Eddie can be a divisive character, people with different opinions. With me, he's already be, always been incredibly good. Mm -hmm. My dad died Christmas 2010. I managed to fall down the steps at Swindon on New Year's Day. Eddie was the person who wrote to me. Mm -hmm. He was the one, he didn't have to. He wrote expressing his sympathy and not just a short one-liner. And I really appreciated that. And he was the one that rang me and said, look, would you come to a meeting? We went to um, what is now Rick Stein's yeah. down at Sandbanks. And there was a meet, and he introduced me to Max Demin very early on because they wanted to know what did I think? Mm -hmm. Because Neil was involved with the club at that point as well. And so I had the benefit of getting to know Max and his advisory group and to see that he cared passionately. You know, uh, occasionally, you know, a shot of vodka or two in the boardroom. <laughs> but all the way through, great passion, a bit of superstition, but yeah. a genuine love and desire and hunger 
for success. And like everything in life, how, you know, how do people know whether you really care about something? It isn't just about, oh, I'll buy you loads of stuff. And it's why do you do that? And what's behind that? And it, it never came across, I'm going to splash all this cash because I just want to create an impression. Or I'm really going to show the world that I've got all this money. No. He did it, because I believe, because he believed in the club and the people running it and wanting it to have the greatest chance of success. And, and you know, you, you saw it recently with Scott Parker's dismissal. Yeah. And the reasons that were given. Now, let's take them at face value. It's absolutely the case that the way Scott had approached something, at least that's what's been said publicly, mm-hmm. led, led to his dismissal. That would have arguably cost them quite a bit of money. I don't know. To, to, to get Scott away. But Max is a man of values and principle. And I think that the, the, the good thing, the one thing I've seen at the club, in all the dealings, I don't, you know, that, you know, I brought Peak Six in. Um, I've enjoyed, as I said earlier, reasonably close relationship with Jeff, and hopefully a healthy respect for each other. Neil, I've seen from time to time. And Richard Hughes, quite a bit too. And you know, invariably, because I because I work, I mean, we we work with half the Premier League sides. So invariably, I will see the guys like I did at Fulham, for example, recently in the boardroom, mm-hmm. because I'm with friends who I work with, advising Fulham or advising any, any, any number of clubs, and so we all know that we're thoroughly involved in the game. And these people, Jeffs and Neils and Richards and so on. They are all integral to the success, but at the heart of it is Max. Max is money, yes, but Max is passion. Max is direction. At the end of the day, can't spend the money unless Max agrees with the vision. And Max had a lot of very close relationships with Richard, with Eddie, with the board. Not a big board. And and a club that has gone from strength to strength. But, you know, we got relegated. And the fans were very divided over whether Jason should have got the job, not got the job. And of course, then Jonathan and the playoff defeat to Brentford. And, you know, if you talk to Fulham fans, some were glad to get rid of Scott Parker. Absolutely amazed yeah. that Bournemouth would take him. And you know, in many ways, you can look and say, are oh, there are a lot of similarities with what happened at Fulham with what eventually happened at Bournemouth? Maybe. But is it a price worth paying that we got promoted to the Premier League? I think most people would agree it's great that we're back. So success is always interesting. How, what, what makes it all up? What makes life what it is? And, you know, we, we, I think we have, a, we, have a, we have a strong team. And that will change in time. You know, nothing is forever. You know, people will move. We'll go to other jobs. We'll go to other clubs. We'll go maybe not going to completely different industries. Mm-hmm. But I, I firmly see it as evolution. We're not. We're certainly not going backwards. Max Demin was a huge leap forward for this club. Yeah. Eddie Howe was a lucky gamble that came off. I think that you know, no one could have foreseen it when he got the job. And we've been through, yeah, r- relatively speaking, a lot of our managerial appointments have not been good. Um, you know, Lee Bradbury wasn't a real success. Jimmy Quinn, yeah, not, not really inspiring. Um, Jason, not perhaps the, the, the right mix to get us where we needed to be. Jonathan Woodgate, it got us the playoffs, but ultimately, are we any different to any other club? If I was a Wigan fan or a Birmingham fan or Aston Villa, whoever, uh, Stephen Gerrard, you know, we'd all be saying the same things. It's different names, different people. Yeah, Definitely. Of course, Bill Foley has taken over um, Mm -hmm. at the club and a very impressive CV to speak of um, Mm. with the Vegas Golden Knights and what he's done there and the ruthlessness he seems to show. um, He did mention in one of his interviews that he's Mm -hmm. not coming into the Premier League to make friends. He wants to actually win and Although we're still a very small club, how could you imagine that this club might look in five, ten years' time um, once he's actually got a bit of control over it, 
Um, and what does he do in that first January window? It does enough to actually keep us in the Premier League or give us a much better chance of staying in the Premier League. Again, it's changed. When we sold Jamie Vincent, we, we put people around scouts at um, Bristol Rovers, for example, at one game to talk and pretend that we had other deals lined up. And that's what led to um, Huddersfield making their bid. Very different now. The guys will have had targets lined up for some considerable time. They will have had um, their game plan worked out as to what they need and where they need it and why they need it. What would I see in five, ten years' time? Much better infrastructure. A permanent home that looks, is, and will be Mm future-proofed. A home that will attract the best players. This is a great place to come and live, isn't it, South Coast? Who wouldn't want to live in the sunshine of the south in an area where there's palm trees and not bad restaurants maybe it could be a few more but a really nice environment not forgetting we actually are an area which has significant problems significant deprivation significant poverty as well so i see a club that under bill foley's leadership will continue to be a really important asset of the community that will reach out and do its bit as only a professional sports team can to help try and change lives. Uh, Again, it's one of the reasons I mentioned about my background. Mm -hmm. People gave me a chance. My mum and dad gave me a chance. There are people out there that don't get chances because of circumstance. It's really hard to change your life. It's really hard to get opportunities but a football club in a community can be a great catalyst for change. And when you've got money, you're in a, you know, we probably often, some of us think what happens if you win the national lottery, you you can make a change to people's lives Mm -hmm. as, I mean, I've used my example happened to me as others have seen. And that's really important to me. You, if you can do things, that at the end of the day, help one, two, three, four, however many people. And I think that will be important to Bill. And I think that what we will have in five, 10 years is a much better, much stronger, more solid foundation to protect against the earthquakes and shocks of the future, because it will be paid for. We won't be in hoc to a bank, I don't think, by the sounds of it, from what's been said publicly. And we will have a much stronger international presence. I think he's mentioned that the areas he's looked at, and it's it's true, we we don't have a strong presence internationally. We don't have many global brands working with us. We don't have huge turnover from overseas. And I think he's got some exciting plans by the sounds of it. And the risk is actually literally, I remember actually, you know, I remember playing risk when I was a kid, you know, when you have your armies on the board and you're moving out. <clears throat> he will know, because he's done this in Vegas, he'll know how and when to expand, to push on. The pace of change is going to be important. You know, they won't rush into doing stuff in January. He strikes me as a man that won't waste money. He'll make it, you know, it's no guarantee of success. A bit like when we just signed Roger Bolly. You, you make as informed a decision as you can at the time. And that's what I think we'll see here. We'll see <clears throat> progression, which will mean ex- it will mean expansion of the number of people working for the club. I imagine that you're going to get US insight, which is quite exciting. I was lucky enough. I was. I, it, it was more by chance than anything. I was in Vegas. I was working. Uh, World Athletics are one of our um, main clients. And... Uh, some of you will will know Chris Temple from his commentaries on BBC. Chris yeah. actually commentates for World Athletics at some of their, their main events. So it's been quite funny catching up with Chris and uh, seeing him at some of the, the big stuff we do. I was out there in the summer in Eugene, Oregon for their World Championships. And I, I hopped down to Vegas, one of my colleagues, and we, we went to meet the Las Vegas Lights, actually, not the Knights, the Lights, which is the <laughs> soccer team there. And, yeah. But it, they, they have bases around where the Knights play. Mm-hmm. So just by chance, more than anything, I'm in the same place. See, actually having seen what Bill Foley and his um, sports operation have achieved and how they're thought of. So he is going to bring, it'd be interesting, I think he's going to bring a governance 
that perhaps we haven't had before. And what I mean by that is if you increase the size of an operation, by, by dint of doing so, it becomes less tight knit. So you've got to try and maintain the culture, set the vision and have everybody part of that. And that 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 is going to impact on governance and the way things are run. Um, you know, for example, if I'm working with the Jockey Club uh, or Liverpool or World Athletics or, um, a, you know, a, a company like Compass or a big catering company, all of them have got immense structures with very strong teams and considerable numbers of people. And I think that for, for, for Bournemouth, this is a journey where a bit like what happened when I took over and when, when, when with the, 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 the fans as a group, when we, we ended up running the club, it was a different way of doing things. And I think that this is probably the first major evolution in the club in that sense in the last 25 years, because transitions of chairmen don't really change things. The transition to Jeff, to Paul Baker, back to Jeff, to Eddie, to Max, that hasn't really changed things in terms of the size of stadiums, the number of people working there. There hasn't been any mass expansion, but now, now we're likely to see that. And you're suddenly going to have huge demands placed on the existing management. Yeah. Because I can tell you, if you're going to manage a training ground project and you're going to manage looking at what you do about a stadium, that in itself requires a good number of full-time people. As we've seen with the work we've done at Luton, at Fulham, and Bristol City, these, these projects are huge. Yeah. And you've also got to be able to keep that eye on what's the team doing? Mm -hmm. What's our investment priority? Um, does what, what goes where what, and so on, knowing how that develops. And, and, and equally, it is fantastic. It's a great opportunity for everybody at the club. There'll be some who will come to the conclusion that it's not for them because it will be a, 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 a different a different journey to a degree but i think that there's gonna if, if there are anybody anybody that thinks that that's going to be a very very few and far between do you think that bill will keep people who have been there and done so much for the club it seems that he's been in contact with neil and uh, richard mm. and i'm guessing jeff as well um but do you feel that he will continue to keep those people on board that have done so much for this club or do you think he may take this club in a whole different direction? I don't know, to be honest. You'd have, probably have to ask him that. Um, <laughs> but if, you, if you look at what's happened to other clubs, mm -hmm. sensible business, and I think I, I said this, I've said this before, if you buy a house, yeah. you don't go digging up the garden unless you really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You kind of wait to see what comes up where during the seasons. He strikes me based on the articles I've read and people that have come across him that he's a man of integrity, loyalty, honesty, and who is very prepared to give people a chance. And so I think that um, it's not like kids in a candy store, but it's a time and a place that says, here's your club. I'm here. Mm -hmm. I can help you do things. And it is a bit like social mobility and helping to try and change people's lives and help move on. There's an empowerment. Again, it depends what culture he, he likes, but the sense of empowerment of saying, you can now help make this happen. I remember, let's take it back to 97. Keith McAllister mm -hmm. was the club secretary, who's one of the longest serving members of staff. And there was a view expressed by some people that Keith was probably a, of the previous generation and my goodness, you know, if we'd known how technology would move on, wouldn't be able to adapt to the future. He was the one that most embraced it, who shone. And until um, he was unable to come to the games as often as he did, we'd sit next to each other, even up to a season or two ago. And Keith, I'll always remember, he said, Trevor, Trevor, we, we don't have problems. We just have solutions. Mm -hmm. And that was his approach, which I think is amazing. And he embraced and seized opportunities. I think that's what Bill's going to give people. Um, 
why would you? Why would you come in and just get rid of everybody? You, you, look, if if you, I believe he's buying a house here, you know, if if he if he's going to be over, that gives him a chance to see people. But equally, why why wouldn't you bring in a couple of people, one or two people, three, four, five people, people who can provide you with knowledge, understanding, skills that might not be at the club already, not to um, threaten people. Not to say, oh, your job's at risk or you shouldn't be doing that. Because if you're part of the vision and the journey, you can see. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I started out doing work in sport, it was after Paul Scally had attacked me at a Gillingham game. And then about a year later, rang up and said, could I help him with a legal problem? Um, at that time, as I started doing work in sport as a lawyer advising, I'd probably be able to tell you everything I everything that was about every matter we were dealing with. And that probably remained the case up until about five years ago. I couldn't do that now because I've got 125 people working globally within my team dealing with amazing projects. Mm -hmm. I trust them to tell me when I need to know. I've got a reasonable idea of where we're heading and what we're trying to do and helping to set that strategy. I think that that's what Bill will do. And he will it will be opportunity and an opportunity for people to lose rather than be told you're not involved Bye bye. Final question: mm. um, Would you ever walk back into <laughs> a football boardroom again in the future, be it Bournemouth or another club? Good question. I, <laughs> I remember we were, we were we were trying to buy Nottingham Forest for a client, mm -hmm. and the Sun put put a story out that I was going to be the new CEO. There was one particular CEO who will remain nameless of another club that rang me effectively attempting to dissuade me from taking that position if I put his name forward so he could get the job. Um, and no, that would not have interested me. I, I love working with great people and I'm surrounded by them in my business. I'm surrounded by them in my personal life. It's incredibly special people that I know in all walks of life. So for me to go into a club, I'd need to be passionate. I'd need to believe I could do something that would help. I'd need to be able to believe that I could give something. So in all honesty, I really enjoy doing that. If someone rings me and says, what club should I buy, Trevor? Or what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? I enjoy doing that. And I've got great lawyers who know how to make those deals happen. So I'd never say never. And... I have been offered some really quite interesting board positions at other Premier League clubs. Um, I've been offered the opportunity to be part of a management team at quite a few uh, clubs over the last three, four years. And that's always a great honour that a client, usually a client, you know, we've looked at buying Everton, we've looked at buying Forest, Swansea, Villa, you name it, we've we've worked with people. And in different situations, people have been kind enough to say, well, I had it yesterday, actually, after we spoke. Somebody was looking at buying a lower league side, and they said, well, we, we, maybe you come in there. Maybe you come and help run it. I said, well, no, that's not that. There, I would say, you know, no, I work with too many other clubs. I can't do that. So long-winded answer, but yes, uh, if it's the right opportunity and I can give something with my grey hair and knowledge and so on then definitely um but it would have to be special and very important to me to make that difference you know i've um i've got two girls who love sport and for them you know it's hard enough for me to get a ticket at bournemouth because obviously going through doing yeah. it properly and not 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 trying to blag favors like which is not right i wouldn't do it at bournemouth i might occasionally ask if there's any way that we can sit together once we've got tickets but um Generally speaking, you know, it's great to be involved in the way I am. And it's it's a real honour. So, But if I can make a difference somewhere, whether that's a small club or a big club, then I probably would do. You know, you know, someone rang me, someone was interested in knowing whether I wanted to be the CEO of a, a f investment fund, a, a country's investment fund that wanted to do deals across Europe in football. And yeah, that 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 would be from an intellectual perspective, that'd be quite interesting, quite challenging to do, and very enjoyable. But it's got to make you want to get out of bed in the morning. 
you, and you've got to do it for all the right reasons. And I think um, certainly a lot older, wiser. I still feel the same age. I still feel exactly as I was when we started this journey. Um, and, you know, if someone asks then, and I've got something to give and it's right, then of course, yes, I would. Of course, going into a, another club's boardroom, if you do take <laughs> up one of those positions in the future, will that feel a bit weird? Um, would you? I'll tell you. Almost I'll tell, boardroom. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. If this is the last question, Go on. I remember we were trying to buy Everton mm -hmm. for some US clients, and um, the funny thing, I think probably the funny thing for Jeff is when I turn up in the Bournemouth boardroom and he hasn't asked me because it's. <laughs> Blackburn or it's Everton or it's Liverpool or whoever it might be and when we were trying to buy Everton I've got to try and remember exactly how the scoring went it was the game where we were down and we came back into it in about the 80th minute was it the thrill yeah do you remember that we, yeah. we came back into yes. it in the 80th minute mm -hmm. I was there and I was sitting on the Everton side with the Everton board mm -hmm. and I kept my hands underneath my legs was sitting on my hands <laughs> so we we we, we equalized and i didn't jump up and um if you remember we, we went into injury time and it was six minutes injury time mm -hmm. and everton scored in the 96th minute yeah and i think it was six minutes injury time given but they spent a long time cheering and celebrating this goal and I thought, well, that's it. You know, well, at least I can eat humble pie and say well done in the, to the, the Everton guys, and that would be that. And of course, what happened was we go and score another goal, at which point I cannot control my emotions. I jump out of the seat <laughs> with my hand in the air. And I think there's a picture of me doing so. My clients have never let me live that down. So it wouldn't matter where I was or what I was doing. I might be out of Bournemouth, but you can never take Bournemouth out of me. And mm -hmm. that's a precondition to any deal anywhere. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, Alistair McIntosh at Fulham, he, he, you know, he grew, grew up as a Bournemouth fan. He works for another team. And there's many people like that around. But um, th there'll never be another team I follow. You might care about another team. It's about like love and life, isn't it? You know? How many people can you love? Is there only ever one true love? You probably, but you will care for and like and others. And that's football. And yeah, my dad took me to watch Bournemouth when I was six, seven years old. And that's what started the journey. If it had been Blackpool, if it had been Gillingham, I know, of course, it would be the same thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Well, if you ever end up in the boardroom of another club um, for whoever it is, game against Bournemouth, um, you'll just have to come and sit in the Ted shed with us, Trevor. I would. I would. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, all right? At the end of the day, like we've talked about, we talked about a number of games on this. Whether the Milk Cup down at Southampton, which was 2 all when I was at university. Whether it's the day, was it Jerry Payton managed? Oh, no, it wasn't Jerry Payton. Oh, I don't remember the name of the keeper in the mid-70s. He hit the post on a horribly windy day. Or well, the day our goalkeeper kicked it out and the ball bounced back over his head when we played Plymouth Argyle yeah. Boxing Day. These are things that we remember. Mm -hmm. But we remember Joe, the auto windscreens final. We remember losing at Huddersfield in the playoff on that long, long journey home that night. But it's all worthwhile, isn't it? Yeah. It's all worthwhile. And it's a love affair that lasts forever and a day and wouldn't have any other way would we well exactly and look at the journey we've been on so now, wait for the look at the journey to come there's another chapter well, ex <laughs> exactly we don't know what the future might hold but champions Trevor league at, champions league at the vitality eh <laughs> well that would be amazing wouldn't it be careful what we wish for yeah uh, premier league champions uh no no, probably know. not, but you probably know. Probably not that one. I think now we know we better wake up. Too much of the mild wine. Yes, yeah, definitely. 
but we can all but dream. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show, Trevor. And thank you so much for coming on yesterday and today as well. Absolute pleasure, anytime. And, and you know, exciting times. We go going to go go beat Chelsea on the twenty seventh. Yes, yep, yeah, hopefully. And of course, we got the Newcastle game beforehand in the cup. So, of course, a very important game next week. And yes, you know, Hollywood movie stars. This uh, couldn't make it up, could you? No, no, exactly. Well, we have got Adonis Creed now as well. So, um, it's crazy for Little Old Bournemouth um, to be in this situation, but long may it continue. Start believing it. We ain't little old Bournemouth anymore. Exactly. We're exactly. A bit bigger than that now. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for all that you've done for this football club. And I'm sure that we'll catch up um, very, very soon. Look forward to it. Take care. Thanks so much, Trevor. Bye-bye. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on this show. Please do remember to hit the like, the subscribe, the bell button below to be alerted to any new videos we do here up the Cherries and Old Departments. Please do check out all of our other interviews. We've had Eddie Mitchell on the show. Of course, Steve Fletcher was also mentioned, plus many more. So do please leave some comments and please do let us know what you think. But until the next one, up the cherries and I'll see you then. Thank you for joining us. (laughs) 